Born in Tamworth, Australia and raised in Sydney, Mark William Wilson studied semiotics and photography at the Sydney College of the Arts before permanently relocating to the US in 1982. He had a transcendent experience at the Metropolitan Museum of Art when he encountered Lucas Cranach's The Judgment of Paris, and I'd love to hear more about that, which for him references the coalescence of the natural world, humanity, and the divine in its depiction of three unclothed goddesses in a natural setting. He currently lives in Springs and works in a former potato barn in East Hampton. Hello, hello, here we are. Thanks everybody for coming this evening. This is a painting that I still have that I found as a, in 1984. It's a painting that I, that I didn't really make, I just found it. It was an old sign on the side of a building that had thrown into a dumpster. I just arranged the pieces. I called it the oneric landscape. It brought to mind a reoccurring dream that I had as a child. And in that dream, I could see in the most distant point on the horizon some kind of movement. Uh, and as I focused on that point, it became, the movement became greater. And within moments, whatever that thing that was moving was just rolling towards me and it was the earth and it rolled over me and I could turn around and watch it roll into the distance. I don't know what that means, but that's my first <laughs> landscape painting. That's my, my first landscape painting. So then I followed that with some painted versions that you let, allowed the paint to express itself. Materiality has a memory, and if you engage in material in a particular kind of way where you allow it to express itself, you know, it will make a landscape painting. You know, you don't really have to, you don't really have to know what you're doing. So after I made these paintings, some artists saw them and I, I hadn't really made paintings before. And they were like, well, have you seen, you know, Blinky Palamo or have you seen Bryce Martin? And, and you know, these were all new names to me and I had to then kind of realize that get, I better get with it because, you know, other people have done things before you. But not that that's like them, but kind of, you know what I mean? It's kind of like that. Okay, so now we're, now we left the planet Earth. I have had experiences that have to do with energy. And these energies are of kind of cosmic dimension. This drawing was made with a pendulum and a pendulum, as Foucault discovered in the 19th century, uh, reflect the motion of the Earth around the sun. And it was from this simple, uh, you know, he was a, an autodidact and, and, and it came from kind of very late in cosmic understanding of how things work. But he discovered that the, the, the Earth's rotation around the sun is actually reflected in the motion of a pendulum. So you can actually go to the Museum of Métiers in Paris and witness his pendulum as it s swings through the apse of this massive old uh, church or something. And as the Earth rotates under that point, it knocks over you know, the domino because in 24 hours, the Earth will rotate once. And you know, so anyway, this was incorporating that concept of mark making. This one in particular is um, made with 14 karat gold and has its own kind of mathematical uh, perfection. Yeah, that one, that's the one I was waiting for because that should have been before that other one. But anyway, this idea of circular, um, okay, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know if I wanted to go into this, but I'm going to have to because it's just, <laughs> I had this experience with, uh, I read a book in 2001 after America invaded Afghanistan. And this book was written by an Afghani noble. His name is Tahir Shah, and he's a travel writer. And he wrote a book about 
you know, they're all travelogues in the, in the kind of Bruce Chatwin vein. And he wrote a book about ancient flight and the history of flight. And the book ended at a, an ayahuasca ceremony in, in the Amazon in, in Peru. Uh, although there have been other references to, you know, ancient and flying and Egyptian and gliders and this and that and all this stuff. But I was telling a friend uh, about this book and when uh, I, I got a phone call from her and she said, you know, there are these Peruvian shaman that are going to be singing at, at this bookshop. And, and so I went that night and, and they did a healing on me, which I wasn't expecting. But, and, and it was about the, the reunification of North and South and, the, and, and that was kind of symbolically suggested by the eagle and the condor sharing the same sky. So they did that, and then afterwards I, I told them about this book that I'd read about ancient flight, and, and, and in the last you know, chapter they were at this ayahuasca ceremony. And I asked them, did they know anything about ayahuasca? And they said, well, all of the songs that were sung to you this evening were taught to us by ayahuasca. Ayahuasca in, the, in their language means the vine of the soul, and the active ingredient in uh, ayahuasca is DMT. And DMT is produced in our bodies, in our, in, in our pineal gland. And it's most active when, when you're born and when you die. So I asked him if it would be possible to come to Peru and experience uh, an ayahuasca ceremony. And, and three years later, I did. And I uh, kind of witnessed the, in my first ceremony, I was conscious and fully awake and aware of uh, the birth of all things, which was not looking exactly like this, but it was a fountain of light on a cosmic scale. You know, that's, that's I mean, it's, it's kind of beyond description. And in, in each kind of photon of light, as I sat there in my kind of completely altered state of, you know, in this portal between dimensions of reality, I was able to have an experience that makes like beyond anything you could imagine. And in each photon of light was mathematical calculation. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so then I discovered that pendulums can easily tap into the, you know, this, because, they're, because they are antennas of cosmic uh, motion, they can become very rhythmic and, and perfect in, and have a certain kind of musicality. So, you know, I made these paintings, which I thought, you know, because the whole ayahuasca experience was very much about a healing. It's, it's, it's a whole healing thing. And I thought that like bringing light into darkness like these drawings do and bringing circular and rhythmic motion and the fact that I made this kind of contraption out of an intravenous bag as a metaphor for kind of contemporary medicine, the whole thing became some kind of a healing process or form. We're just kind of jumping along here. So that whole experience had a very kind of a beyond my wildest imaginations, but this one's called um, Portrait of God. And I heard a funny little story on the radio last week and they were talking about a child and the teacher went up to them and said, what are you drawing? And he said, I'm, I'm making a portrait of God. And then the teacher said, but nobody knows what God looks like. And I said, just wait a minute. And, and, and they will. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my version. Mm. Okay, so then after those pendulum drawings, I found a, 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 a 19th century device called a harmonograph, which is a pend pendulum-driven drawing machine that in the mid-19th century had, what did it have? It had kind of, it was like a party, a uh, reason to have a party. People would have, you know, there was a company in London that made these things that you could fold up and take to a party and you'd get it out and set this thing in motion and everyone would have drinks and have fun and you'd make these things. but. I had a very isolated winter with the monograph, and it was like a kind of form of self-hypnosis. And I'd set this thing in motion, like just the all day long, like the, the, making hundreds of drawings. And after some weeks, I came back, you know, and I just sort of set it in motion, go away, come back, and, and I came back, and there was this eye looking out at me, and I was completely like, "Whoa, you know, there's some this multi-dimensional kind of reality that I 
seemed to be attracted to, um, was looking out at me. Then they could, kind of took on a, it's probably because I was very alone, they took on a rather erotic quality. And, and, and there were more eyes and there were more erotic and there were just eyes and erotic. And I, and I decided to make, I did a show in Paris, uh, you know, that was sort of dedicated to George Bataille and the story of the eye or the story of O. The pendulum continued to move around, and this is just a single tracing of a single line. In this sense, rather than on a cosmic dimension that seems to be more like cellular, this, as the, as the pendulum moved towards the middle, the cell seemed to be kind of becoming more polarized, or the drawing became more polarized, and, and, and it kind of reminded me of a cell splitting. So we went from kind of you know, macro to micro without too much trouble. I translated some of that cellular energy into uh, some oil paintings. There's different, that's a view in my studio, some cosmic ones. Oh yeah, I, I also like it when you, when you make things and things occur on the edges of your creativity that you're not really planning. So these are both palettes. Um, initially, the green, you know, I was mixing for something else. And then, you know, I just saved everything. I always just save everything. And then, you know, I just kind of added the flowers and, and they became kind of more like a... I found that when you take things from the edges of your creativity, it's like kneading dough, you know. You, you, you bring something from the edges into the middle and you focus on that, and that enables other things to occur on the edges. <laughs> So here we are. This is what I really should be talking about because this is what's up in the show here, the, um, the William Merritt Chase. As we all know, you know, Chase was the, you know, premier uh, painter in these, this neighborhood. The palette uh, on the top is, you know, suggestion of what I just talked about, this idea of something happening on the edges of your creativity. And I just kind of like the way that those two things occurred together. What's always interesting to me, and I like to remind people, is the the landscape of Chase. There's no trees. There's very there were, there were very few trees. There was no topsoil. I guess it was more like a, you know, the moraine from the. I mean, it's only 130 years ago or so, but there's there are very few trees. I, I like that. I wish it was like that. There's another thing, you know, with a with a detail from a from a Chase painting and some palette paintings, on paper. There's a thing, I'm showing the bigger thing. And there's a, um, this is something else that I played with. And I, I, I kind of like the idea of just like a door and a brick wall and a shovel. And like, you know, nothing, all this idea of like, we have everything gets cleaned up with Photoshop. And, you know, what this painting is about is, is it's about that all cultures seem to have something that is sacrificed. And, and in our culture, that which is sacrificed seems to be the landscape. The equal-sided cross doesn't have any Christian reference, but it has to do more with uh, a balance. And that balance uh, is represented by the horizontal line, which is the physical realm, and the vertical line, which is the spirit spiritual realm. I'd never actually seen a, a landscape painting in, in kind of cruciform before. After I made it, and I thought it was kind of a great symbol for our time, our present time. You know when you ride a bike and you can't go any further and you just like dump it? Because <laughs> the sand is too thick? That's what this is. It's like I couldn't go any further, so let me just make a painting of that. But that's also William Merritt Chase, the painting inside of a painting. Oh, that's what I didn't talk about. This idea is if, if, if you create... Um, the same light, like the light that I've got in the chase there, even though it's a kind of a crude rendition, beyond the, the frame of the chase painting is my painting. But because it's the similar kind of light, it enables you to suspend your kind of disbelief and think that that is the same landscape. And it is the same landscape. That place is there. You know, the light is the same since, you know, we've got the same sunshine. Maybe we've got different bicycles, but... This idea then kind of became an idea of like compressing time, that you can look through time through light. So I don't know if that has any relevance to the future of time and space, but there it is. And there's another one. And 
Oh yeah, so yesterday I went to see, I, mean, <laughs> I went to see Jojo Rabbit. And at the end of it, there was a, a quote from Rainer Maria Rilke, who was, I read a lot when I was younger. There was a quote at the end of the film said, let everything happen to you, beauty and terror, just keep going. No feeling is final. And that's, <laughs> there I am having that kind of ecstasy, uh, which is kind of beyond culture, it's nature. You know, just out in the, in the North Atlantic light, in the ocean, and, and in my state of happiness. Thank you. Thank you.